Where are we going now? Well, we're just passing Usher Point. We're going to go about two miles south of it, in close, because I believe a B-17 plane uh, crashed there. Really? Oh, World War Two. Yep. Wow. And only in about six metres of water. So I'm going to run in close, and there's a lot of coral reefs here. Can you watch, see if you can spot any uh, straight lines? Yeah, sure. Hey, Dad, there's a straight line just here off the port side. Could be a wing. Right, that sounds promising. I'll bring her around. We'll get the anchor down. Anchor. I was no expert this day on identifying World War II planes. I can see it has two engines on one wing, so it must be a four-engine bomber. A B-17 Flying Fortress bomber comes to my mind. Her outline is shrouded in coral and home to lots of fish. The wreck appears to be only one wing. The fuselage and the second wing must have sunk elsewhere. John Harding is down here with my son Dean and I, and I realise that what we have found is truly a mystery plane. Its location never recorded because all the crew must have died in the crash. 231 planes crashed in Northern Australia in World War II. Some are still missing, and this is one of them. It's a chance discovery. Oh, what a great dive, really good. Definitely a B-17, radial engines. Yep, great. Well, definitely a B-17 was not to be when my discovery hit the news. Aviation experts differ. It becomes a big mystery. The wreckage of what's believed to be a World War II bomber has been discovered off Cape York Peninsula. Experts are trying to determine whether it's an American or Japanese aircraft. It's a mystery of the not-so-deep. The wreckage found just six metres down off the tip of Cape York. 231 World War II aircraft went missing in the far north. A dozen remain unaccounted for. Experts say this one is probably either an American B-24 Liberator, a B-17 Flying Fortress or a Japanese Emily seaplane, which may have been shot down by anti-aircraft fire during bombing raids on Townsville. Aviation experts in the Defence Department could not identify the coral-encrusted wing on my video. I know I must return to this plane, armed with all the knowledge I can gather to correctly identify it. Could it be the B-17 called Pluto that carried an American general, or the B-24 called Punjab carrying high-ranking officers? Relatives of those lost airmen would appreciate closure. I run north again on my vessel Freedom 3. We plan a four-week expedition full of adventure and exploration. Our first day at sea is a good start. While up ahead, it's breaching. Wow! wow. I know they're magnificent. Oh, look! Can you see? Can you see that, Cos? Fabulous! North of Cape Bedford, off Conical Rock, is a sunken bomber I want to find. You remember Sharon, Adam? Well, she was up here on a trawler and they snagged an obstacle somewhere here and uh, she went down to help to free the nets and found the nets were wrapped around a plane. 
Now, I know of a Mitchell bomber that crashed here in December 42, about 25 miles north. How did north. you find out about it? There must have been survivors Oh, or yes. Yeah, there, there was 12 survivors, seven injured, uh, but they all got ashore on the beach here, and two of them decided to walk all the way to Cooktown. That's quite a trek. Took them two days, and they had, you know, a lot of dangers. They had to wade across reef shallows, wade across creeks, and, uh, of course, there'd be the sharks, the rays, and very likely crocodiles. But a rescue boat came and picked them all up so every one of them was saved. So hopefully, this is the plane that I want to find. Here it comes, Alan. Oh, yes. Right on it. The lost plane is a B-25 Mitchell bomber called Eight Ball Esquire. She was on her way from Cooktown to Port Moresby to engage the Japanese. Adam and Dean's full face masks allow them to communicate underwater in the poor visibility that's down there. That's the net my friend Sharon snagged on the plane. Hers wasn't the only one. I can only just see what you're talking about. <laughs> see how it's flipped upside down? Landing gear sticking straight up in the straight up in the air. Let's go and find the nose. Let's go and have a look. See this here? That's the nose wheel. It's collapsed down into the uh, fuselage there. So it's not like the rear wheels, the wheel is actually still here. Yeah, I can feel the uh, track underneath it. Yeah, that's the rubber tyre that's still there. Well, that's the nose there, Adam. Yep, I can see it. All the perspex has been smashed, but you can, you can still see. Somewhere. Yep, I can see. It's all full of mud, but I think there'll be stuff in there. Maybe we should uh, dig it out. Yeah, have a bit of a dig around. I can just see a, a bullet or two, but I'll have to keep looking. I'm amazed you can see your nose in front of your face at the moment. Oh, this is horrible, dude. This is not diving. <laughs> have a look at these, dude. I think there are 50 caliber machine gun rounds. So we're definitely at the front of the plane. Now, if the bullets are here, well, the gun's probably here somewhere too. We'll have a bit more of a dig around. Here, Adam, here's a machine gun in here. There's the barrel of the machine gun there. Yep, I see it. I can see That's the bullets it. here, yeah. Pull them out. Look, they're 50 caliber bullets. There's a bit of mud. I might just pull them out. Yeah, pull them right out. Look at that. They look like 50 caliber, eh, Adam? Yeah, these look like 50 caliber. Have a look down here, Dean. I think I've got some uh, smaller munitions, actually. But here, I think I found some uh, 303 rifle shells. They're actually 30 calibre bullets from that machine gun we uncovered. Can't really tell until we get them uh, a bit cleaned up. If I remember correctly as the story goes, this plane was carrying a lot of small munitions, so... Maybe we'll find some pistols or rifles in there as well. Maybe we should keep digging. Yeah, they were transporting a whole bunch of cargo up to Papua New Guinea. 
they had rifles. They had some push bikes as well. There should be some push bikes in here. Well, I can't say I've seen any push bikes yet, but I guess we can keep digging. Let's see if we can get that machine gun out. Okay, I'll see if I can pull it out. I'm gonna pull. Ah, there it is. Yeah, hold it up higher. Give it a lift. Oh. That'll be a. Uh, that'll be the smaller calibre machine gun. Covered in stuff now, but. Oh. Very heavy. Look at that. This here, it's definitely a Mitchell bomber. There's the nose wheel, and there's the two wheels behind the engine, so it's got to be the 8-Ball Esquire, with all its armaments. Oh, oh. Oh, look at that! That's the, that's the nose gunner's gun. It's like .303 or something like that. Not a 50 cal, but a smaller one. Look at the handles on the bottom of it there. Yeah, hold on to. That's awesome. <laughs> Look at that. Go down again. The doomed aircraft had lost oil pressure and altitude rapidly, making a hard ditching that injured seven of the crew. All that was on the plane is still here, even a service revolver in its holster. Have some lunch. Here's the uh, the eight ball Esquire and the crew uh, standing in front of her. Uh huh. Ah, there, there's that pistol. That's probably the one that you found. Yeah. Th and in the, the holster. Yeah, the leather holster and everything. Now, see this one here. Right. That uh, that's the flexible nose gun, and I think that's what I've uncovered. I've the, uncovered the barrel. The barrel. Yeah. yeah. So that's a 50 caliber. Eh? Yeah. Think. Think that it's it's upside down. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. It, imagine yeah. it's upside down. Yeah. And um, I've dug down to about here, mm -hmm. and another half a foot down. Yeah. Well, there's the barrel, and we yeah. can we can just see that. A lot more digging to do, but we'll get it out. Are there any other more, uh, guns there? There may be. There's. Uh, oh yeah. Jack Hain for, yeah. in the U.S. He's a war photographer. He took this back mm -hmm. in for, in 1942, and this is two weeks. Before it crashed. Before it crashed. So, so what we're seeing is what it's got. Yeah. So, so there's the, the the main one, the big 50 caliber. That looks like a little um, uh, 30 caliber there. It could be. Yeah. There's another gun there, and we haven't found yeah. that yet. Yeah. So it'll be in there somewhere. Right. Well, that's good. We know there's another one, and being upside down, it would have dropped down, and it would not be buried very much. No. I'll have a dig for it. The buried barrel of a larger machine gun is revealed. It must be the 50 caliber all those bullets belong to. There's the nose gunner's protection plate. The gun is too heavy for Dean to lift. He uses a lifting bag inflated from his air supply. The alloy fuselage has acted like a sacrificial anode and remarkably preserved these Browning Colt machine guns. They're destined for a museum. Wait till you see this thing. Wait till you, you see it. It's huge. Oh, might need a hand. Wow. It's a very, very big gun. That's a 50 caliber. That's the one the uh, the nose gunner swings around and shoots. Mm. Woo. It's heavy. Glad we had the lift bag. It's just too heavy to lift underwater. Mm. Great. Look at that, wooden handles on it, and even the breech still moves a bit. Look at that. 
Yeah. It's still moving. Yeah. You right? Yeah. I think they, they still have gun powder in oh, stuff really? like that, yeah. Be careful. So if I can bend the bullet out of it just a little bit, slowly, slowly. Huh. So keep bending it around and it should just slide out like that. 60 years underwater. Oh, it's still dry. And that gunpowder is still dry. What are we slowing down for, Dad? Well, hopefully we're onto a barge, two barges here. Oh, yeah? Now, there's a rumour, it's only a rumour, that there was an actual Japanese invasion. La uh, troops landing here on, on the mainland, mainland Australia. Right here uh, on the beach in really? here. And they landed a, a tank and a truck and troops, and the intention was to go down and take Cooktown. But apparently when they tried to get around the Macaiba River, uh, they got bogged in the swamp, gave it away as a bad job, and sunk the barges. Oh, now, really? if we can find the barges, prove that they're Japanese, that's a big, big story. That'll rewrite some history books. Yeah. We're coming up pretty close now. All right, here it comes, here it comes. Oh yeah. A lot of fish on it. There is. If it's not Bit of a bump. If it's not Japanese, we're going to do very well on the fishing anyway. It's a big barge, a little too big for a landing craft, and it seems to be broken in two. It lies only a short distance from the Mitchell bomber. Penetrating a gloomy wreck can be full of surprises. Cleaner shrimp work over the eye of one big cod. Adam's leg almost brushed the venomous spines of a linefish. Now that's the fish we want to catch, a nanny guy. Perhaps this porthole will give us a clue. It looks like half a barge, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't think it's the whole thing. No, I don't think it's the Japanese landing barges, but uh, still nice. Yeah, it's a nice time. Lots of very big fish down there. Yeah, Let's see if we can catch some, eh? I have a crew of eight on board, and they all pop on deck when the fish are on the bite. Here he comes. He's a trevally, I think. You've already seen my sons, Dean and Adam, down in the murky depths digging for relics. You got a big one, Jilly? That's Jilly Skinner from Sydney with an unwanted trevally on the other end. Here we go. And Karen Brandstater, also of Sydney, who appears in several of my adventure films. <laughs> Rowena Horn comes from the Gold Coast. She works at SeaWorld. Oh, Corinne Barton hails from Perth with husband Tony, who is now hauling in the biggest fish. Someone get me the gaff, please. A large mouth nanny guy. Oh, he's a good one. I'm passing Cape Melville and coming into Bathurst Bay. Here is the best of Aboriginal rock art hidden away in the cave galleries up there.
We pick the high tide to avoid a walk across gooey mud. The high water presents a different problem. We've got to cross this creek here, but first we have to make sure there's no crocodiles. Just, just don't get any closer. Are going to send Tuffy first? No. <laughs> You're first. <laughs> I think it's far too dangerous to swim across here. I'm going to go this way, up over the rocks, and try and keep to the shallows. So I'll get across first, and then if I'm OK, you follow. Okay. A simple wade across a creek is very dangerous up here. I'm keeping a sharp eye out for any dark shape that moves. You can't be too careful. A couple of years ago, a big croc dragged a man out of his tent at the next beach to here. They shot it, but another croc would take its place. Just look for black shape. The rock art I'm leading them to is worth it. Just up here a little ways. The caves are just here. Over here, guys, these would be the, the best cave paintings on the east coast of Australia, and I discovered them a few years ago. And they're very obvious and different to any other uh, Aboriginal art. You've got the axe, pipe, barrel, uh, he, a sawfish, more axes. I think this is a horse up here. And down here, we've never been really able to work out what this is, but I think that they are sacks of uh, pearl shells because back around the 1890s, the pearling fleet came down here. And it's quite possible that the Aborigines helped them in, in this work. And for payment, they've, they've got these uh, axes and knives and so forth, brought them up into this cave and painted them. After 1899, no more. They never came back because there was a horrific cyclone in this area. Uh, category 5, the uh, tidal surge was 40 feet, almost up to where we are now, and it wiped out the pearling fleet, 70 ships, 300 men, and uh, probably hundreds of Aborigines, and that was the end of the pearling fleet. Now just over here is another cave with more uh, paintings. With a march fly, got him. <laughs> You've been studying these? Yeah. We've got more one. axes and quite a few knives here. Dingo, I guess. You can see here that uh, there's lugger paintings everywhere here. Mm -hmm. And they're badly faded, but all, all the way around here. If you crawl up under here, you'll see a lot more paintings there. They've been busy boys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's a dolphin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hard to see at this angle, but this looks like a, a crocodile and a sawfish and then a, a huge drawing of another crocodile. No wonder that we were worried down there in the creek there because the Aborigines have drawn a lot of crocodiles up here. See anything interesting? Ben, I think I've found a kettle here. That's possibly oh. a fire. Right, mm. and <laughs> looks like E.T. here. What a strange figure this mm. one is. It's a tight squeeze. You ready to go home? OK, let's go. Fish is always on the menu. And we also need some carcasses to bait the crab pots. Too easy. It's a succulent mangrove jack.
Dean scores a finger mark, another choice meal. We set the pots that evening and check them out now at first light. The crabs have had all night to make their move. Last year, I potted mostly females, so I hope now the females are on strike. Oh, oh wow. Two, three males and a female. They look delicious. Absolutely delicious, yum, yum, yum. This one's a female here, and you can tell the difference because of that wide flap there, and it's got smaller claws, so she'll go back. I uh, see that one on the bottom, there's a smaller male. You see how the flap is, uh, is a lot narrower. Pull that one up. Facing up, great way. Becomes a dangerous part. <laughs> getting, getting the little one, wrong ones out. All right, that's baby. Goodbye. Now we're going to find the female. Oh, don't hurt her. <laughs> See that wide flap there? That shows it's a female. So Let's she's see. got to go back. Goodbye. Look, she's lost. A few legs in a wall with a male. They do grow back, don't they? Yeah, they will yep. grow back. Okay. You're free. Oh, got it. Don't fall in there, Tuffy. Oh, oh wow. my goodness. Even more. Oh. Wow. Look at here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight crabs. That's not bad. One it's female, so seven miles. <laughs> Look at this tubby. Look. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't want to fall in there, would you? Yeah, disappear fast. Sounds like it's singing, but it's probably rubbing yeah. joints. Ah. Oh, thank God. Hey, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Out. Oh. Oh. <laughs> There's a way to go. I know, there's too many crabs in there to grab at. <laughs> Always got your finger too. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no. Got the fuel little, line. Little pinch of the fuel line. <laughs> Come on. As I pass the western end of Corbett Reef, a pod of pilot whales join us. Dean finds time in his busy filming schedule to relax with some strenuous kite surfing. Tony and Corrine relax by exploring Morris Island with Tuffy, my old sea dog. Look what we have here. What's that? It's an old grave. Well, there's no name on it. It looks like it gets a lot more attention than most graves that you see in the cemetery, though, even though it is a lonely spot. Got bits and pieces from everything. A morning fog shrouds a calm sea as we head north and out of this mist come the dolphins. I'm going to drop in on a wreck just up here that I found a few years ago. It's got uh, lots of ammunition. Is that, is that from the Second World War or the First World War? Man? Oh, no, before that, about um, 1880s. Uh, in fact, just after the Civil War, because the uh, bullets we found, the ammunition, are uh, those uh, 45 uh, slugs, 
and also some larger ones, 0.58, and they were used in the American Civil War. Ready to go? Okay. Okay. a dozen in this pile. Now this would be cargo on the ship going up maybe to New Guinea, up in Indonesia or somewhere like that, to a tin mine or maybe a gold mine. There's even more over here. Look at this over here. <coughs> There's a smelting pot. On, on wheels, on, on like a trolley. Now this smelting pot is upside down, but these wheels would have been to wheel it into a furnace. It's wonderful how the corals are just slowly growing over this wreck. It's almost hard to see the, that there is a wreck here. There's no indication of an actual ship, just these hard items which have survived. Well, it's easy enough to see what this is. This is an anchor chain. It'll be running back over the edge of the reef. So when the ship hit the reef, they've dropped an, an anchor, but the ship's kept being pushed right up on top of the reef. And this is where it's settled. It's built and slowly broken up. Now, these are not coral rocks that I'm looking at here, these are ballast rocks, very important. These were right down in the build of the ship. Oh, really heavy. There we are. These could have come from anywhere. Could have come from Australia, England, Cape, Cape of Good Hope, somewhere like that. And these are simply to, as weight in the boat, while ballast, ballast rocks. And that's the best way to tell what a shipwreck is. When you see these rocks, you know that a ship broke up right here. All over the seabed here is lots and lots of ammunition. This whole seabed here. It's hard to see. If I start to fan away, that's lead. Now there's quite a difference. That's the 45 slug, the old World West 45 from the Colt Revolver or the Winchester. And the larger one, oh there, there we are, there we have an intact one. Virtually ready to fire. And then you've got these big ones, and these are the, um, uh, to use in the slider, the 0.577 or 0.58 caliber. When flying over Hunter Point, I spotted Hidden Falls up a creek and I believe no one has trekked to them. My team are enthusiastic to be the first. You'll be taking this map to get an idea where you go. Um, the falls are about 4K in, but the creek is not going to run straight. It's going to curve around everywhere, so it's probably a 10K walk. There's a whole lot of goodies that I've brought. You're going to need torches, GPS in case you get lost, candles for romantic dinner tomorrow night and waterproof bags for, for Dean's camera. Very important, a first aid kit and inside you'll see those bandages for especially for a snake bite or uh, crocodile bites. So is there a campsite for us to stay at? <laughs> no, this place is primitive. No white people have been up there. So then what will we be walking through out there? We bush, water, 
mostly water. You'll be walking oh, up croc. the creek. Or when you see a freshwater croc, you'll probably climb up on the bank. Just a freshie, nothing to worry about. The dinghy is used to get past the deeper water near the creek mouth. Looks like that's the end of the road, guys. I think we'll leave the boat here. So we're walking it the rest of the way? Walk and swim. When it's too wet for Dean to film, Adam swaps to the waterproof camera. Oh, there's another crop. I think we should stick to the land for a bit. The trek is physically exhausting, but they're young and fit. At age 70, my excuse is I had to look after my boat and Tuffy. Freedom 3, Freedom 3, Freedom 3. This is Hunter River, Hunter River. Do you copy? Uh, Freedom 3 here, yes, I hear you okay. Yep, we've reached the waterfalls, just set up camp. Uh, our ETA back tomorrow is still about 2 pm, over. Okay, I'll see you in 1400 hours. Uh, Freedom 3, over and out. Tie a bow line around your end, right? Surprisingly, both the creek and the falls are unnamed. So we've applied to officially name them Hunter Creek and Freedom Falls. such a beautiful place remain hidden, not visited, not named in this modern era. Carnivorous pitcher plants are prolific at the falls. Insects crawl in to reach the tempting nectar and are trapped when the lid closes. It's tranquil below. A succulent prawn skips by. Perhaps in days long ago, the Aborigines feasted on the prawns, the turtles, and the eels. This is a special place, unspoiled, hard to reach, and never to be forgotten. Hey, 
okay. Time to go, everybody. Don't worry, we'll be back. I don't want to go. It's too pretty. Yeah, it's beautiful. Welcome back. So what did you think of it? It was hard work, but it was worth it. The falls were spectacular. Wow, that was just fantastic. This engine's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Dawn highlights the remarkable red cliffs at Usher Point. There a seam of bauxite running across Cape York Peninsula from Weeper. reached our final destination. Off here is the sunken plane that has drawn me back. We're getting close, very close to the bomber that I found last year. What type of bomber is it? Well, this is what we've got to find out, B-17 or B-24. It's just southeast of these red cliffs at the Usher Point. I'll spin it around, we're coming into the shallows here, and you may see it visually. All right, I'll have a look. Can we identify this mystery bomber so that the relatives of the lost airmen will know the resting place of their loved ones? I think that's it right there. See that straight line? Oh yeah. See that couldn't be coral formation, that must be something down there. Do you reckon it might be the wing or something? We won't know until we jump in. I've got the wreck. I've got the, the wing right here. Now, the whole purpose of this trip is to identify this plane. I've shown the film to experts, and none of them could conclusively say it's a B-17, a B-24. There are little things we've got to look for. And that photo there shows a B-24 in the foreground and a B-17 in the background. They are different but we're really only looking at the wing and two engines. Now, the B-17, the cowling on the engine is round, while the B-24 is slightly oval. Now, there is another identification which is possible. The landing gear of the B-17 folds upwards behind the engine, and the B-24 landing gear folds up under the wing between the two motors. So if we can get look under the wing, if, if that's possible, we might see where that landing gear is. Now, if we can actually see into the engine, we can count the cylinders. So a B-17 has nine cylinders in a radial, and the B-24 has two rows of seven cylinders. So we've got to look for all those items to try and identify this plane. It's not going to be easy. Armed with all this information, I'm confident we'll make the identification. What you can see here is the um, one of the motors that have broken off. This would be the inside motor. Obviously, that prop was bent when it hit the water. It must have hit pretty hard to bend it like that. Now I'm going to try and see if the front of the cowling is round or oval. It does look round to me, but it's pretty hard to, to really tell. I think what we need to do is tilt this motor right over and then for sure, but there is something interesting here. This is a uh, intake, air intake, and I think the B-17 had one of these on the bottom of the motor. So imagine this is the bottom, the other side is the top of the motor. So, so far, so far it's looking toward a B-17, but not, not absolute. Anyway, there's another engine over there. We can check that out. Now, what we're seeing here is the rest of the engine mount. 
That piece over there, the engine with propellers, sat in this section here. Uh, here's the other engine, the second one, a bent propeller, and the engine is right down here, buried under the sand. So it's pretty well impossible for, for me to really judge it. It just looks like a great hunk of coral, but it's actually the engine. Now where it was mounted on is over here. This is the uh, second engine mounting, the outside one on the wing. Again, nothing much to tell us what sort of plane it is. The engine has come off, and that was what we saw over there, buried with just one prop sticking out. So what do you think? Do you think they... They had an explosion in mid-air? Well, Dean, it's quite possible that the plane exploded in mid-air and this wing came tumbling down. But I think, really, the whole plane hit the water at a tremendous force. And this wing was sheared off, but it ripped off right inside the fuselage because it still goes on further on. And the plane would have been catapulted further onwards and it could be even several hundred meters further south because this is the way it was heading heading toward the south but she's hit with such force this wing has literally been ripped off when it hit the water and everyone would have died Now what I'm going to do is look for the landing gear. If it's a B-17, it'll be tucked up under the back of this engine. If it's a B-24, it'll be between the two engines. Oh, wow, wow. I think I've got it. I think I've got it. There's a, a big tire under here, a big one. Oh uh, yeah, Dad, I can see it. I can see the tyre in there. What I'm going to do, I'm going to use the knife and prod this uh, tyre in here. I should be able to feel with the knife whether it truly is a, a rubber. Right, now it looks like a tyre. Oh uh, yeah, I can see it there. You can see the tread pattern on the tyre. Definitely a tyre and definitely a B-17 bomber, which is great. Now we know exactly the model of this plane and then we can work out which plane this was. But I still think, just to be real, real sure, we'll pull that motor up so we can see whether the cowling is round. That's our second conclusion. I have to use the boat motors to achieve this. The engine must weigh more than a ton. Okay, I'm going forward. All right, she's coming out of the sand a bit. All right, I'll stop. I'll stop there. Perfect, perfect. When the silt clears, we'll see what we have. So what we've got here 
is a perfectly circular cowling and only a B-17 has that. So now we've got two conclusions. We've got the tyre in behind the engine, the round cowling, and we can go for three. We can count the cylinders. There should be nine. Do you want to do that, Dean? You haven't seen them over there. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You got nine? That's Good. Nine. Good. Well, we know now that it's definitely a B-17, a flying fortress bomber. We've got three conclusions beyond doubt. So, which plane was it? Personally, I think it was the Pluto. And she was lost on uh, March 26th of 1943. And she was carrying on board an American general, Howard Ramey. Now, she was on a flight back from Port Moresby to Horn Island and Brisbane. And she struck terrible weather in the Torres Strait. And they never heard from her again. Obviously crashed. And everyone was lost, including the general. And I think this is the Pluto's last resting place.